My name is Sam Vaknin and I'm a columnist in Brussels Morning. And today, no, not the Middle East, another turbulent region, the Western Balkans. And the recent meeting in Tirana, the capital of Albania, a part of the Berlin process. Now, the Berlin process sounds very ominous, but actually it's supposed to be very hopeful. Is the European Union gaslighting the Western Balkans and its countries? In Tirana, another summit of the Berlin process between the European Union and the Western Balkan polities has ended in grandiloquent and largely empty promises, as history shows. The impoverished, hopelessly corrupt and badly governed countries of the region, Albania, Kosovo, North Macedonia, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Montenegro and Serbia, they are caught in the EU's delusional Hall of Mirrors, also known as accession and enlargement. These backward locales are supposed to miraculously undergo two revolutions, not one, but two green and digital. And in the meantime, they're faced with multiple dangling carrots, such as freer movement of goods and services into the European Union common market and within it, as well as investments in roads, other transport modalities and energy, including electricity. Hope springs eternal. The European Union imposed a few minor and equally delusional conditions on this utopia. A better business climate, fewer regulations, integration of the domestic markets, and most laughably, the perennial fight against corruption. The truth is that the Western Balkans will never accede to the European Union. The war in Ukraine, Brexit, and the rise of authoritarian regimes in new members such as Hungary made sure of that. In the wake of the elections in Slovakia and the contested elections in Poland, the European Union is teetering on the, break, on the brink of disintegration. The last thing they need right now, in this fraught time, is new members, most of which are anyhow at each other's throats periodically, but predictably, for example, Kosovo and Serbia currently. Such local conflagrations also threaten workers' mobility and thus the common economic space. The European Union is also faced with a major immigration crisis within the Western, uh, with the Western Balkan aspirant states serving as the main route of transit to the heart of Europe, notably Germany and France, from the landing beaches of Greece and Italy. The European Union has survived multiple traumas in the past two decades, including major financial crises, multiple, energy dependency on a foe, Russia, and COVID-19. But the European Union is badly scarred and badly wounded. The European Union's response to these variegated ex exigencies has always been attempts at closer, often coerced, integration joint procurement, common debt, the same legal space, and shared foreign security and defense policies. But this integrative reflex militates for tighter, smaller, and more contained union. As it is, consensus among all existing members is near impossible to build on critical issues such as foundational values of democracy and rule of law, or Brussels' reach and control of the internal affairs of its constituents and constituencies. Difficult to form consensus on these issues. The rancor and acrimony gave rise to populism and xenophobic nationalism everywhere, and to an almost exclusive emphasis on the bilateral the, rather than the multilateral. North Macedonia's drawn-out accession process is the most glaring example of this shift in emphasis, hampered as it was by Greece and Bulgaria, Macedonia's disgruntled neighbors. Similarly, Hungary threatens to veto Ukraine's mooted membership 
over its alleged mistreatment of the Hungarian minority in its midst. The truth is that the EU has reached its absorption capacity long ago. It has been rendered inefficacious by successive waves of widely disparate new members whose entry had been geopolitically motivated in the first place. The European Union has stagnated. It is unable to regulate itself through the maze of inane unanimity and qualified voting rights and the misallocation of its minuscule budgetary resources via cohesion funds for the more indigent members. An egregious example, a really bad example of such misguided profligacy is the common agricultural policy, one of the main impediments to the accession of Ukraine, an agricultural powerhouse. Hungary, Poland and Slovakia are now faced with a WTO complaint filed by Ukraine over the bans of its grain entering the domestic markets. The looming threat of a re-emerging Russia is not an impetus for enlargement. On the very contrary, the invasion of Ukraine engendered a siege mentality in the bloc. The European political community, an initiated polylog among leaders, most recently in Granada, that is intended to forestall accession, not to hasten it. It is about displacement, not about resolve. There is now talk of Macron's gradual integration. After two decades of infertile talks, it is an interesting and welcome departure from conventional bureaucraties. But it is dead on arrival, literally impossible to implement without a major disruption to the EU's daily business. At heart is a debate about the very purpose of enlargement. Is it a geostrategic tool or a functional and merit-based expansion of a common market with shared values? If it is the former, then some candidates like Ukraine would enjoy a fast lane, ignoring the merits of their applications and the unforeseeable outcomes of war, while other candidates languish in an apparently interminable process.